Hi friends, welcome back to Creeps and Creeps. My name is Cece Delaney and today we have an interesting one. It's the Hammersmith ghost. So it deals with the murder of a man named Thomas Melwood, but then also a ghost. So I guess this is kind of a fun bonus because you're getting a two for one today. But first, if you're new here, welcome. I hope that by the end of this episode, you like this content enough to subscribe on YouTube or wherever you stream your podcasts and are compelled to leave a like or review with five stars obviously being the most helpful. I'm trying to build a communicative creepy crew around these parts. So any questions, comments, concerns, they're all welcome and encouraged in the comment section on YouTube as always, or the related Instagram post on Creeps and Creeps podcast. Okay, let's get started. This case seems to have officially kicked off sometime in November of 1803 in a town called Hammersmith. It's also less than five miles west of Buckingham Palace and in the early 19th century represented the border of the countryside in the city. The town really blew up in late 1803 and it was basically a bunch of just new houses and apparently had a ghost problem. The village people had a suspicion that there was a ghost running around Black Lion Lane and it was thought that it was a man who had slit his own throat in 1802, so just the previous year and that he had been buried in Hammersmith churchyard. However, the problem is, is during that time, people were like, or nor, you can't kill yourself. That's bad juju, my guy. And so everyone freaked out and basically assumed that he was a restless spirit because religious beliefs were very prevalent in that area at the time. And religion dictated, you do not off yourself. You wait until the good Lord above does it for you. This particular ghost was described as being really tall, dressed in all white, but also was said to wear a calfskin garment with horns and large glass eyes at other times. Well, it was apparently scary enough because it freaked this man out who was driving a wagon that was pulled by eight horses carrying 16 people. And the driver was so freaked out that he just fled on foot, bailed on the horses, wagons, and passengers. And what I assume to be a very expensive but also very lucrative business. In another instance, one random night, an unnamed woman was reported to have been grabbed by a local ghost while walking near a cemetery. I don't know why I said local ghost as if this is a traveling troop of ghosts, but we're going with it. She said that she saw the ghost rise from a tombstone and it grabbed her while she tried to run away in full panic mode. And she was so affected by her encounter that she ended up getting overwhelmed enough to faint from the stress and she was there for hours before finally being discovered by her neighbors. Luckily for her, they were not serial killers and they wound up taking her back home and put her safely in her bed. However, she did not last long in bed and she ended up dying in the night due to fright. There was a similar experience with a man named Thomas Groom, who was a servant at the time, and it is eerily similar to the woman who fainted and then subsequently died. He said, quote, I was going through the churchyard between eight and nine o'clock with my jacket under my arm and my hands in my pocket when some person came from behind a tombstone, which there are four square in the yard behind me and caught me fast by the throat with both hands and held me fast. My fellow servant who was going on before hearing me scuffling asked what was was the matter. Then, whatever it was, gave me a twist round and I saw nothing. I gave a bit of a push out with my fist and felt something soft, like a great coat, unquote. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to read Old English. I spent a good 10 minutes just saying that quote over and over and over, and I still could not get the inflections correctly. I'm so sorry. Please just bear with me. This is not a reflection of my podcast, okay? Around this time, people started to wise up and realize that it was probably just some butthole running around and terrorizing the villagers for the vibes. So hordes of men wandered around the streets of Hammersmith, pistols at the ready, prepared to put an end to the terroristic shenanigans. But unfortunately for the ghost hunters, it turns out the village had so many lanes and paths and tiny little trails mazing through the town that it was really hard to cover every possible entrance and exit. Now that we're all backstoried up and ready to go, we're gonna get right into the meat and taters of this whole thing. On December 29th, 1804, William Girdler, who was a night watchman, saw the ghost as it was running. (laughs) Its cape fell off. And so he was like, okay, so this is definitely just someone messing with the town. Confirmed. And since at the time London didn't have an organized police force, William decided to take it into his own grubby little paws to stop the menace. So he decided it was high time to form a posse and just start roaming the streets, guns a-blazing, ready to get this guy. So at the corner of Beaver Lane, while he was making his rounds at around 10.30 p.m. on January 3rd, 1804, Girdler met another of the armed citizens patrolling the area, 29-year-old officer 
brother named Francis Smith. Smith was even more upset than William was, and he had had just about enough of this bullshit, and he was fully prepared to do whatever it took to defend his little town. But it wasn't just enough to decide on having the balls to go ahead and take care of this ghost problem. He needed to get his liquid courage into his system, and so he went to the local pub, got fairly hammered, and then headed out. Again, guns blazing. I cannot reiterate enough that these men were packing heat ready to take names, but also like massively intoxicated. So armed with the shotgun, Smith told Girdler that he was going to look for a supposed ghost and Girdler agreed that he would actually join Smith after he called the hour at 11 p.m. and that they would take the ghost if possible. And then they went their separate ways. Smith encountered a man named Thomas Millwood, who was a bricklayer who just so happened to be wearing the normal white clothing of his trade, which were, quote, linen trousers entirely white, washed very clean, a waistcoat of flannel, apparently new, very white, and an apron, which he wore around him, unquote. Millwood had been heading home from a visit to his parents and sister who lived over on Black Lion Lane. At this point, you may be asking yourself why in the fuck this man, Thomas Millwood, would choose to wear this outfit in the middle of a full-fledged ghost panic. But don't you worry, Thomas had two very good reasons according to him. First, they were the clothes of his trade. Second, because he was stubborn. In fact, his family was basically like, okay, maybe it's time to stop wearing your work clothes around town. People are getting jumpy and trigger happy. Why don't you just wear a big coat over your work clothes? That way you can avoid getting mistaken as the ghost. Again, considering that he had already been misidentified as the ghost twice before. Third time's the charm. Bad luck is still luck. And he was lucky enough to come across Girdler and Smith that evening. The decision to wear his white work clothes mixed with the fired up ghost vigilante Francis Smith inadvertently kickstarted a 200-year-long English legal debate regarding the basis for the legal principles of self-defense. Continuing on in the evening of January 3rd, the night Francis Smith decided to resolve this whole ghost issue, he stated that he had seen a white figure and that he had called twice but did not receive a response and the figure continued to proceed toward him, which sent Smith into a full panic attack and he started shooting wildly into the night. However, according to Thomas's sister Anne, immediately after seeing her brother off, she heard Smith Smith challenged him, saying, quote, Damn you. Who are you and what are you? Damn you, I'll shoot you. Unquote. She then recounts a flash of light, after which Smith shot him in the left of the lower jaw and immediately killed Thomas. After hearing the shot, Girdler and Smith's neighbor, John Locke, together with another man named George Stowe, met Smith, who, quote, appeared very much agitated, unquote. And upon seeing Thomas's dead body in the street, the guys were like, Hey, hey, Smith, you should probably go ahead and head on home because fuck a police police investigation. It's also probably a good time to mention that gunshots were not out of the ordinary in this area, and it was said that you could hear a gunshot about every 15 minutes, so it really didn't surprise people when they heard a gunshot. No one was super concerned about it. Meanwhile, a constable arrived at the scene and took Smith into custody before Smith could head on home. Thomas's corpse was carried to a pub by Girdler, where a surgeon named Mr. Flower examined the body on January 6th after the body had laid there for like three days and pronounced the death to be the result of a quote gunshot wound on the left side of the lower jaw with a small shot about size number four one of which had penetrated the vertebrae of his neck and injured the spinal marrow unquote which left the coroner with no choice but to deem this as a willful murder very quickly after the murder on january 13th the trial started and would be a really important part of english history smith was being tried for willful murder and this case would be a very difficult case because it challenged the self-defense laws at the time smith had testified that he truly did believe that Thomas was the ghost and that he thought that he was defending himself and showed so much remorse that he was unable to stand at times. And during the coroner's inquest, witnesses further corroborated this possibility, stating, quote, the night was so dark and gloomy and the limited light in the lane was obscured further by hedges on either side so that it was difficult to see a person on the other side of the lane, which was less than four yards wide, unquote. Don't forget Thomas was wandering the streets in pitch black with minimal lighting on a dark and foggy night in full white. I mean, yes, you shouldn't get murdered because you're wearing your work clothes, but Thomas, my guy, this is not the first time that this little confusion mix-up had happened. What were you thinking, my sweet love? Multiple character witnesses came to the defense of Smith and said that Smith was a gentle guy who wouldn't hurt a fly and had gone out that night with the intention to defend the town that he loved so much. Thomas's wife got on the stand and said that she had warned him to cover 
his white clothes with a great coat because he had already been mistaken for the ghost on a previous occasion saying quote on saturday evening he and i were at home for he lived with me he said he had frightened two ladies and a gentleman who were coming along the terrace in a carriage for that the man said he dared to say there goes the ghost that he said he was no more a ghost than he was and asked him using a bad word did he want a punch in the head i begged of him to change his dress thomas says i as there is a piece of work about the ghost and your clothes look white pray do put on your great coat that you may not run any danger and thomas's sister testified that although smith had called her brother to stop or he would shoot smith had fired the gun pretty much immediately so it was a very much a case of stop it what are you doing pew pew Despite numerous people saying that Smith was actually a good guy, the chief judge at the time advised the jury that malice was not required of murder, merely an intent to kill, which he kind of had going out and about with his gun, kind of already theorizing that this could be a person and not a ghost. I can see this judge's point. He said, quote, I should betray my duty and injure the public security if I did not persist in asserting that this is a clear case of murder, if the facts be proved to your satisfaction. All killing whatever amounts to murder, unless just justified by the law or in self-defense in cases of some involuntary acts or some sufficiently violent provocation it becomes manslaughter not one of these circumstances occurred here meanwhile smith denied killing thomas and said that it was simply a case of mistaken identity which i guess really won over the jury because they were really empathetic towards smith they understood and appreciated his good intention and one of the three judges on the case actually had to remind them that just because there was a quote abominable person guilty of the misdemeanor of terrifying the neighborhood, unquote, didn't give Smith the right to run around shooting whoever he thought the ghost was. He said, quote, he did fire it with a rashness, which the law does not excuse. In all the circumstances of the case, no man is allowed to kill another rashly, unquote. The judge basically closed everything down by saying, yes, Smith might be a great guy, but he did kill someone and he did leave the house with the intention of killing someone slash something. So let's just go ahead and stow that away in our brains and think about that as we deliberate. So after an hour of thinking about it, the jury decided that he was not guilty of murder and returned a verdict of manslaughter. But the laws at the time didn't allow the judges to accept this verdict because this was not a charge that was brought against Smith. At the time, if that charge wasn't available, like in this case, they were going for first degree murder, the jury couldn't just be like, mm, mm, no, I think that's manslaughter, actually. This was very much a, you are given a choice of first degree murder or innocent. And the jury could not decide that he was guilty of either and so they tried to strike a middle ground and the judge said "Mm, that's nice go ahead and turn your little cute butt cheeks around get back in there and get me a verdict of the two options that I asked thank you so much so the jury went back did their public service and ended up deciding that Smith was actually guilty and he ended up sentenced to death by hanging but anybody who wasn't a juror went pretty feral over this decision and it got so overwhelming for Lord Chief Barron he immediately reported the case to the crown who was king george the third at the time and king george ended up commuting smith's sentence to one year of hard labor on january 25th instead of hanging so then was there actually a ghost apparently a few days after the murder of thomas millwood a cobbler named john graham came forward and admitted that he was the ghost he said that one of the apprentices in his shop was fucking around with his kids and freaking them out with ghost stories and basically terrorizing the graham household because then poor john had to go home and tell his kids no, ghosts are not real. Chill. It's fine. So he decided that it was a good idea to give his employees a taste of their own medicine and he wrapped himself in a white tablecloth and tried to frighten the workers at night on multiple occasions. Interestingly, Graham was a singer at the church and even sang at Millwood's funeral, which seems a little weird to me considering it's low-key his fault that Thomas got murdered because he was farting around with his stupid little tablecloth, but I guess that's neither here nor there. In January 1804, Graham was actually arrested and charged with being a nuisance and he admitted that he did this but only on December 29th one time which contradicts what he said before where he said multiple occasions but okay and it's up in the air as to whether or not people saw the ghost after Graham's arrest some people were like yeah it's still floating around town being a menace but then most people really didn't report seeing it what a shocker despite the obvious quote-unquote death of the Hammersmith ghost the townspeople would allege that the ghost of Thomas still lingered around where he was put to death and the 
Hammersmith pub. And locals to this day claim about every 50 years at midnight on a full moon, the Hammersmith churchyard is visited by a white specter floating through the graveyard. At this point, I think we can all agree that the biggest takeaway is stop while you're ahead. If you know that the town is running around trying to murder the ghost, stop fucking with people and dressing up as a ghost. But then also, we're not victim blaming. This is just a suggestion. Maybe consider wearing not white running around this tiny little terrified town at night. But anyway, what do we feel the common consensus is here? Obviously, we figured out that the Hammersmith ghost is just a guy in a tablecloth and then a poor unfortunate bricklayer. But I mean, what do you guys think? Is this just a case of mistaken identity? identity? Is there actually a ghost who is biding its time waiting for someone else to get shot and take the blame? And then, I don't know, go back to terrorizing people over a hundred years later. Was he in it for the long game? My money is just on unfortunate drunk people with guns shooting other unfortunate workers in the town. That's just my opinion, but you're free to have your own. And I'd love to hear it in the comment section. Do you think Hammersmith is currently haunted by the ghost of Thomas or just another guy in a tablecloth? If you guys are interested in cases that revolve a lot around ghosts or haunted locations, please let me know in the comments of YouTube or on the related Instagram post at Creeps and Creeps Podcast. I love reading all of my comments, the good, the bad, I love that a little less, and the constructive, so please don't be afraid to voice your opinion. But that being said, don't be mean to each other in the comments section. We're all allowed to have different perceptions and opinions, and that doesn't make anyone better or worse than anyone else, okay? So let's just be nice. Thank you. If you're streaming this episode as a podcast, please consider consider throwing a rating my way with five stars being the most helpful and subscribing to the show wherever you're listening. I also have a blog post dedicated to each episode where I put my sources and any sort of video component to this. So head over to the website, creepsandcreeps.com. Has new episodes, has blog posts, has really everything, you know? Until next time, keep those little noggins on a swivel and please try to stay safe. Thank you so much. Goodbye.